Greetings fellow Ampaholics. It's been a week or so since the last video and I've got a real dandy for you here today. Uh, it's a 1966 a Blackface Princeton Reverb Amp which appears to be in really nice original condition with a few uh, little shortcomings here and there that I think can be remedied easily. So let's proceed in a normal fashion where we check it out real close from the outside and then take it completely apart and see what its strong points and shortcomings are. Okay, stay tuned. Okay, let's start off with uh, the Fender emblem, which looks great. Uh, just a little bit of paint loss. Uh, could stand a, a little polishing and cleaning. Grill cloth looks great. There's a tiny little hole top left. And another one uh, bottom center. But other than that, I think the grill cloth looks real nice. It looks like there's a darker area here. Uh, maybe a little moisture, spilled beer, or something like that. Now let's take a look at the uh, dash panel. It uh, really looks nice. It's dusty. Now, uh, as my subscribers will know, um, when I get uh, an amp like this in, I do not do anything to it first. You and I see it for the first time. So uh, this is all the original dust and everything that was on this when it came in. Okay, uh, I will also do a second part of this video in which everything is cleaned up and optimized. But for now, you're seeing it just the way I see it. The knobs look really nice. Um, Fender Musical Instruments, so we know this is shortly after uh, CBS took over. Before then it was uh, Fender Electrical Instruments. Okay, so everything looks really nice here. We've already discussed this. Uh, I've seen people rant and rave about patented 68. How can that be when this is a 66 amp? 68 does not refer to the date of the patent. It has to do with some other identifying characteristic of the patent patented number 68, I don't know, uh, but it is not a date. The uh, chassis straps on, to on top look great. Handle, we got a little burn here, maybe cigarette or soldering iron or something like that. Um, Tolex is a little grungy, but Pretty darn close to perfect. We've got a little spot there. Got a dent here. Something's falling against it here. Uh, don't see much else to complain about. Uh, you can see the finger jointing when the light's right here beneath the Tolex. Okay, so first off, I learned something about the knobs on Fender amps and I'm going to share it with you. Okay, from my own experience and study, there's at least three different types of black knob that Fender uses on these early amps. The first one we'll look at right here has a Allen head set screw at one and if you look inside it has a pot metal insert that goes on the shaft. This gives also has the threads for that set screw. So your set screw is threaded into metal rather than into plastic. Also one other thing that's kind of cute, they call this the Snowman 8. Uh, as you see the little head is smaller than the body. So this would be uh, the Snowman uh, Allen head at one type knob and this was found on a 1967 uh, Princeton Reverb. So around 1967 or so they were using these. Maybe 68, I'm not sure. Now here's the second type. And it has the uh, slotted set screw. It's blued so that it, it kind of matches the uh, color of the black knob. It's at one. It has no metal insert, so you're threaded strictly into plastic. And they always have a number of some sort, probably a molding number, casting number, something like that. A couple other uh, injection molding uh, marks and sprues and things like that. But that's the way this looks. Now this is from a silver face uh, Fender amp. Several different types use this. It is not the Snowman 8. The top and bottom are the same size. 
This is going to be the third type, and this is the oldest, and this was on uh, this 1966 Princeton Reverb. We've got the slotted set screw at 10. We've got the metal insert here, pot metal insert, and we have our Snowman 8. So on your 66 and earlier uh, Fender amps, it should be this style of knob with the set screw at 10. I don't believe these are remade, so um, if you're ever buying an amp around 66 or earlier and it doesn't have the set screws at 10, you might be a little suspicious. It's not the end of the world, but it's not exactly right. The one other thing you notice is that the numbers are bolder on the Allen head set screw and the uh, slotted set screw at 10, whereas on the silver face amp with the slotted set screw at 1 and no insert, the uh, numbering uh, is a little uh, tighter, a uh, little finer line. I think it's fairly obvious when they're all together. If anything, here the set screw at 10 has the coarsest or broadest numbers then this would be in between and these would be the finest. Now I know I'm splitting hairs here, but this stuff's important, okay? And, and it's very hard to find this information any one place. So I hope that this makes sense and uh, was interesting. Okay, let's turn this beast around and take a look uh, at the back. Well, here's the rear view and as you can see, this one has just the simple rectangular upper back door. It doesn't have those angled wings on it that we see on some of them. And to be honest, I've seen them both ways. Uh, I don't know if it's early in the year, late in the year, or whatever, but they put this type of upper back door on a bunch of these. So it can go either way. Power cord is scrawny. It's not the big fat one with the red uh, plug at the end. It's, I believe the cord itself is probably original because the strain relief here looks like an original piece but of course this plug is something out of a hardware store back in um, the 1970s or so that's been added so it's got to go. I might even put a three wire plug on this. Uh, we'll see. Let's go down the line. It still has the original 200 watt uh, warning for the uh, utility outlet here. Uh, ground switch which is functional with a two wire cord. You pick whichever position hums less. The fuse holder looks to me like it's been replaced. This looks more modern. It doesn't look like the old ones exactly. I might be wrong but it, it just sticks out so far and it's kind of shiny at the end. I'm thinking that's uh, been added. On off switches uh, there is no standby on this because the Princeton was not quite as big and fancy as the Deluxe Reverb. Uh, notice the plug for the speaker is not the Bakelite or Phenolic plug, but a, a metal plug that looks like it's old as sin. So this may be original. This wire isn't, the wires to the speaker, but that may be original. I can't, I can't really say. Uh, the all-important Underwriter Laboratory sticker. Um, I don't have a foot switch for this, but I have foot switches, which I'll try on it. Then, uh, kind of a downer, uh, we've got the Radio Shack uh, cables for the reverb, which are no good at all. And I will order the shielded, proper external braided shield cables for these with the red one marked uh, for the reverb input. Then we look over here at the serial number. We get the A13307, uh, which places this squarely in 1966. A not so pleasant discovery is right here where somebody carved their, probably their driver's, driver's license number into the chassis for identification in case the amp was stolen. Um, I don't like it. Uh, I don't think it helps the value of the amp any. Probably doesn't hurt it much, but uh, I can tell you having lived back in the mid 60s uh, that the police encouraged people to do this and would even loan you that little diamond engraver to do this. It was a little vibrating tool and uh, had a diamond tip and it would uh, carve into metal and they urged you to do this, I guess, to make stolen property easier to recover. Unfortunately, it was done to this amp. Uh, it's sort of a uh, one of those holdovers from the past. Uh, it's upsetting, but it's the way things were back then. Well, this seems a little odd to me. The upper screws for the upper back door are flathead Phillips 
and you can see a ring around the outside like they should have had those body washers, those uh, contoured washers, whereas the screws on the bottom are oval head and there is no mark for a washer. So either this upper back door came from a different amp that used the washers or back in 1966 they used oval heads on the bottom and washers on the top. It's not the end of the world but it is kind of a peculiar finding. Okay, back panels are off. Uh, we've got the reverb tank which uh, in the bag which has to be opened so that we can check it out. Held by the embossed strap with the proper screws so that looks good. Uh, looks like we have the right speaker. Uh, it is a Jensen from the 16th week of 1966 which sounds right. It's got the typical uh, writing on the uh, baffle. It looks like a number 298. Um, everything looks right with this speaker except for the wires which appear to have been changed at some time. Although they did a decent job and ran it through that strain relief. Okay, the tube chart says it's a AA764. Okay, that means it should have a GZ34 uh, rectifier. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, no, we've got a 5U4 rectifier, so that's not correct. The GZ34 rectifier is much better. It draws 1.1 less amp from the power transformer, and it puts out a little higher plate voltage. So I'm going to have to get a GZ34 rectifier for this. Everything else looks uh, correct. It's got uh, PK down here, which would be probably November of 1966. So it makes sense then, if the speaker was made in the 16th week of 66, it could have been incorporated into an amp made in the 11th month of 1966. Everything looks correct there. Unfortunately, the part of the tube chart that shows the GZ34 is missing. I'll have to look in the bottom. Maybe it's in there somewhere. Okay, so everything looks really good so far. Let's take a look at the reverb tank. This shouldn't be sticking up like this, but uh, let's see what we got. One little tidbit here with the reverb tank out. We got 298 on the baffle and 298 down here on the floor. I'm not sure if that they numbered the lumber when they put these together. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, we've got the nice little original embossed hold down strap here for the uh, reverb tank. Floor looks pretty clean, a little dusty, but basically pretty clean. Okay, the tank bag looks good. You can see where the strap has been shielding it from the dust. Uh, no tears, no problems with it. And uh, here's the tank. Uh, the numbers are upside down, but you can tell by the dark gray color this is a Gibbs tank. Now most people expect to find Accutronics tanks and uh, Fender amps, but in these earlier ones the first tanks that uh, Fender used, my understanding is, were Gibbs tanks. If you look inside, everything looks pretty much like an Accutronics tank. It's a two-spring tank with the transducers. All the wiring looks good. The reverb does work on this amp. It seems to me like it's not as strong as, quite as, strong as it should be, and it may be an AT6 uh, tube. We'll see. But uh, there's the tag, Gibbs Manufacturing. Okay, most often seen in uh, Gibson amplifiers. Oh, and let's take a look here at the cardboard base. You don't see uh, the dark lines here from, uh, that you'll see from an amp that's been treated harshly where the springs bounce down against the cardboard. So that's a good sign. The fact it has the cardboard base is a nice sign. Okay, so, uh, so far so good with the reverb. Uh, the cables are bad, but the tank looks fine. Okay, now the final uh, disassembly. I unplugged the speaker and we're going to pull the chassis and take a look at what surprises, hopefully pleasant, we find inside. I can tell from the screw heads, if you run your finger over them, there are some little burrs that uh, this uh, chassis uh, has been out of the cabinet before. Uh, probably not all that often, but it definitely has been out. Well, the top of the chassis is absolutely spotless. Uh, there's no rust, no melted wax from transformers, no sign of heat. 
um, it's as nice as it gets. I doubt that it looked much different from this when it left the factory. Transformer check, we've got um, 022772, which is a 125P1B, so that's correct. 022913, which is a 125A10B, that is correct. And back here we've got an 022921, and that is a 125A20B, so that is correct. Um, looks like a nice pair of RCA 6V6s. Um, nice original tube shields. I already pulled them off and took a look. These are original RCA tubes. Uh, these are not, so these tubes have probably been replaced. I'm going to have to check them anyway. Uh, and then we got that darn 5U4 rectifier, which is not correct uh, in this chassis, I don't believe. And I'm going to order um, a GZ34 just to play it safe. Uh, this draws an extra 1.1 amps from the transformer and can cause the transformer to overheat. Although I see absolutely no evidence of that. It looks like this transformer just came out of the box. So, I don't know, maybe I'm just an old fussy old man, but uh, I still think I'm going to put the GZ34 in there. This looks like the original can cap. I'll have to check the, um, the date on it to see. Okay, so um, let's flip this beast over and take a look at uh, what surprises await us underneath. Okay, the inside of this chassis is immaculate beyond belief. It's, it looks like new, uh, and there have been some modifications. But look at this. Not even any dust. No dead spiders. Um, power transformer is perfect no signs of melted wax or or overheating um, it looks to me like the soldering here on the can capacitor has never been touched usually it's over here on the ground that that it gets messed up um, now uh, some modifications it appears that uh, there's been some capacitors changed and resistors uh, the old carbon resistors have been changed for more modern carbon resistors. Okay, and then also the uh, bypass capacitors have been changed for the tubes. All of which makes good sense. Uh, and it's absolutely beautifully done. Look at these leads. Straight. You could not do a better job. Um, I, my hat is off to this person, uh, whoever did this work, and also they changed this resistor. Um, whoever did this work did a magnificent job. It's absolutely beautiful. So, uh, I think uh, right now it's time to order some parts and check some tubes and uh, try to fix this beast up to op optimize its performance and make it look as nice as possible. One last little bit of masochism here. Uh, as my subscribers know, I've had a bad run with speakers here lately. Uh, last one was great. Uh, let's go ahead and pull it and take a look just to be sure there's no masking tape or uh, God knows what else stuck in the cone. Okay, I know the suspense is killing you. All eight of the nuts are removed and the lock washers, here goes. Oh, thank God. I don't see any uh, cracks, marks, or anything. Uh, beautiful. Speaker dirty. Somebody must have been upset uh, with the song the band was playing, threw a beer at them or something. That's probably what stained the front grill cloth also. I'll have to clean that up a little bit. But uh, man, this looks terrific. I'm very pleased. Okay, time to order parts and get to uh, the restoring on this. Well, that about does it for part one here of the two-part video series on the Restoration of the 1966 uh, Fender Princeton Reverb. Um, I hope uh, there were some decent tips, uh, particularly to do with uh, different knobs, and that you enjoyed as, as we disassemble this. Like I said, uh, the first time I saw it is the same time you saw it. Okay, I just I took it apart right in front of you, and now it's a matter of optimizing each of the parts, replacing the bad ones, and putting it back together to make it just as good as it can be. So stay tuned for part two. Uh, it'll take me a little while to get the parts, but I look forward to seeing you in the near future. Until then, bye for now.